Hey, good morning. Pastor Jody, First Baptist Church, Kaiser, West Virginia. Again, as always, I just want to welcome you back and pray that you've had a blessed week in the Lord. So let's go ahead and begin with this week's word. We're going to be going to Revelations chapter 3, and we'll be discussing the church at Philadelphia. Now, we've already discussed the six other churches. There's only seven letters to the seven churches. And so we come to the final church, the church at Philadelphia. And I pray that as we've been discussing the other six churches, that you were, you were receiving the word of the Lord through all six of those letters. And I pray that you receive the word of the Lord today as we go through the seventh and final letter to the church at Philadelphia. Because we can glean from God's word. Every time that it's proclaimed, every time we read it, every time we hear it, we can glean something from the word of God. And so I pray that we've been allowing the Lord to speak to us. Even, the, even through the letters to the churches where they weren't doing things you know, very good or so right and we're using that word allowing that word to correct us in some in some areas that maybe we've been struggling but I pray that we have a great desire to be a part of this church at Philadelphia now this church is going to hear no words of condemnation because they had their relationship with the Lord figured out and again we want to be part of that faithful church and so the Lord's going to describe himself in, in a several different ways as we begin in verse 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. The first thing uh, that the Lord says here, the first way that he describes himself, is that he who is holy and true. Now, this always reminds me of John chapter 14, verse 6, where the Lord said to them, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And this, this gives us a great picture of who Christ is. He is holy, He is true. And we can trust in Him. He is the way, He is, he is the truth, and He is the life. And so we need to seek the way. We need to seek the truth. And we need to seek the life. And then he goes down and says, He that has the key of David. Now, in Luke chapter 1, we're, we're told about the birth of Christ. And we're told about the angel Gabriel coming to Mary and, and informing her that she is going to give birth to a son. And she shall call his name Jesus. But she, as we go down in, in Luke chapter 1, we get down to verse 32 and 33. He says something very key here. And I think um, it's referring to Revelations chapter 3 verse 1. He says, He will be great and he will be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of, of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. So, he's getting the key of David, the throne of David. This is a picture of Christ as ruler, the righteous judge. So he describes himself as being holy and true. He's now describing himself as being the righteous judge. It also says in that first verse that he who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. John chapter 10 verse 9 says, I am the door. This is Christ speaking. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Christ is the doorway for people today to get to the kingdom of heaven. We must enter by him. Therefore, we must receive him into our hearts, into our lives, confessing our sins and giving him complete control. There is an open door for people if they will only walk through the door of salvation, which, which is Jesus Christ. Now, he also says he shuts doors and no one can open. You know, and again, you know, from the Gospels, the Lord Jesus Christ says, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. There are folks today, religious folks, who have never surrendered their hearts to Christ. There were religious folks in the day of Jesus Christ. We talked about the Pharisees before and how would they would not surrender their hearts to the Lord. They would not recognize Him as Savior, as Messiah. And so they will not go through that doorway. They refuse Christ. So that door was shut to them. 
And that's a horrible, horrible place to be. And I pray that you're not there today. If you're living and breathing today, the door is still before you. And it will open to you if you seek Jesus Christ with your whole heart and you surrender everything to him. Verse 8 says this, I know your works. This is something that Christ has said to all seven churches. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength and have kept my word and have not denied my name. There are five or six things here that the Lord said or was commending this church for. He says, I know your works. Now, every time the Lord says, I know your works, that's exactly what he means. He knows everything that we have ever done. And so, concerning this church, when he says, I know your works, he knew the good works that they were doing. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We are his workmanship. We were created to be the praise, glory, and honor of Jesus Christ and to Jesus Christ. And I pray today, church, that, that we are his workmanship. And so we want, we, want, we want to know our works, just like God knows our works. And we want to know that we have been approved. And we know that we have been approved by the works that we do. It's by grace that we have been saved. Not of works, lest any man should boast. It's the free gift of God. We are saved by God's grace, created to do good works for Him. We cannot earn salvation. It was, it was freely given to us. But the works that we do, we do for the glory and praise of God. And I pray that the church is doing that today. So the Lord says to the church here at Philadelphia, I know your works, and they're good works. He goes on to say in verse 8, I have set before you an open door and no one can shut it. They have a, This church had an open door to Christ. That means they could go in and out into God's presence as often as they, as they wanted to. They could go to Him in prayer. They could go to Him in praise. And there was a constant open line of communication between this church and the Lord. Today, we should desire an open line of communication. We want that open door. The only time this door gets shut is when we sin. We sin, and it blocks the doorway. I don't want to say the door gets shut to us because we're saved by God's grace, but there is a separation there when we have sin in our life. So it must be dealt with. It must be confessed. And once we confess that sin, that you know, we can see that that door is wide open to us again. He says also that you have a little strength. This church gives me hope. This church gives me great encouragement because when I read you have a little strength, I understand that this church was not a mega church. This church was not a gigantic church. This church was probably small in numbers, but the effect that they had on the community and the surrounding regions was huge. And the reason it was huge is because of their faith and trust in the Lord. Church today, if we would just put our faith and trust in the Lord, our God, in every situation, the impact we can make in this world would be great. He goes on to say, you have kept my word. They didn't stray from the word of God. This was a time, we'll learn just a little bit, this was a time where you know, false teachers were trying to get into the church, much like today, and try to change the doctrine and the word of God. But this church wouldn't be swayed. They were testing all the spirits, and they kept the Word of God. Today, if somebody comes in preaching something other than the Word of God, it's false. And if somebody com comes in preaching something that you think is new, prove it by the Word of God. Prove it by the Word of God. Study the Word of God, and we'll prove what is right and what is wrong, because the Word of God is right. If it's not found in the Word of God, then it's wrong. They have kept the Word. I pray today that the church today is keeping the Word of the Lord. And they have not denied my name, saith the Lord. Matthew chapter 10, verse 33 says, But whoever denies me before men, him I also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Don't deny the Lord. We can't be that true church if we're denying 
the Word of God and the God of the Word. We must surrender completely to the Word of God and to the will of God. And by doing that, we will not deny His name. There is, by, there is no other name by which man can be saved but by the name of Jesus Christ. There's no other way to the kingdom of heaven. He is the doorway. And to get to the kingdom of heaven, you got to walk through Christ. You have to go through Christ to get to the kingdom of heaven. And so I pray today that you are not denying God's word and you're not denying his name. And if you're not doing those things, we have a great chance to be a part of this church. Revelation chapter 3 verse 9 says, Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed. Again, this speaks to the religious sect in the world, even today. There are religious folks out there who do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. So just like the church at Smyrna, there were religious Jews that came against the church. But this particular church wouldn't be swayed even by the religious folks of that day. So we too today cannot be changed by traditions or rituals that a lot of churches maybe are involved in. And what happens is with those traditions and, traditions and rituals, they begin to serve those things rather than the one who created them. And it, and it causes fellowship to be broken with the Lord. And so in that day, there were Jews who were trying to get into the church and was trying to convince these people that Christ was not the Messiah. But here clearly God says that they are not Jews. He said before that not all of Israel is Israel. Meaning that not all of Israel was serving Jesus Christ. Oh, there were many there that were. But there were some that were not. And they were trying to sway the church. Verse 10 says, Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. The hour of trial is the great tribulation period. And the promise that the Lord has here is that He will keep His church from that hour. To me, this speaks to the rapture of the church before the great tribulation period even begins. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 and 17 talks about the Lord stepping out from the clouds and shouting with the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God. And it says, The dead in Christ shall be rise first than those of us who remain after that that belong to Christ shall be caught up in the air together to be with him for an eternity. This is the rapture of the church. And so here we have a great word to the church that he will keep us from that hour, hour of trial. And I believe, again, that hour of trial is the great tribulation period. I do not believe the church will go through the great tribulation period. And that will be a very, very difficult time for those who are left behind. Oh, I believe that there will be people who get saved during that seven year period, but it will be very difficult for them. We, you know, if you study the book of Revelation, you'll know that about halfway through that, uh, the Antichrist is really going to ramp things up, and you're going to have to take his mark. If you don't have that mark, you won't be able to buy and sell. That means you won't be able to get your groceries and gas and different things like that. And so living that life will be very difficult for the believer, but it is possible. But I pray that you don't go through that hour, that you be a part of the church that will be rescued, just like he, he got Noah and his family out, just like he got Lot and his daughters out of Sodom before destruction came. So God will also get the church out. Revelations chapter 7, verse 13 and 14 says this. Let me just turn there quickly. Verse 13 and 14 says, Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, Who are these arrayed in white robes, and where did they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you know. So he said to me, These are the ones who came out of the great tribulation, and washed the robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So here the Lord asked John the Revelator, Who are these people that are clothed in white? John didn't recognize them. John was a part of the church. But... Had this been the church, I think John would have recognized who these were, but he didn't recognize them. So again, to me, that speaks 
that the church is going to be raptured out before this hour of trial. trial. But the Revelation 7, 13 and 14 also speak about those who will be saved during that seven year reign of the enemy. And they too will come out of that and will be clothed in white and become a part of the church as well. Let's go down to book at verse 11. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. Hold fast, that no one may take your crown. Christ is coming so quickly. So we are to hold fast to our faithfulness. We know as believers that Christ is coming back soon. So stay faithful to what God has called you to do and be in the church. Verse 12 says, he who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him a new name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him a new name. The pillar, I believe, that the Lord is mentioning here in the temple is a reference to our eternity with Christ. It will never be brought down. It's permanent. Our position and place in the kingdom of heaven is permanent. Christ will give us a new name that only he knows. We'll also get that new body. We'll become that new man, that new woman. And we'll be in God's presence for all eternity. The last verse, verse 13. He who has near, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Have you heard what the Lord has said? And are you ready for that day that the church is going to be raptured out? I pray that everybody in the sound of my voice is a born-again follower of Christ. And if you've never surrendered your heart to the Lord, I pray that you do it right now by confessing your sins and asking Jesus Christ to come in to your life and take control of it. I pray that you've prayed that prayer, and I pray that you are studying the Word of God to show yourself approved in this world, because the world needs to see every Christian, every Christian, living a life that's pleasing to God. Hey, thank you for joining me this week. I pray that you have a blessed week, and I'll see you next week.